For those of you who haven't met me yet, as she mentioned, I'm Dr. Shane Westfall, psychology professor here on campus. Um, I know a lot of people, if they don't have a background in psychology, when they hear a psychologist, they assume that I do counseling or therapy or something like that. I don't do any of that. I'm not empathetic enough. But uh, what I do is I'm a research psychologist. Uh, the short version is I come up with ideas to try and better explain human behavior, uh, develop the appropriate research method. If I get lucky and find something, then I publish it in findings. So that's my background. Now, if you have taken a psychology class, you've probably been introduced to the idea of nature versus nurture. That's something that we research psychologists spend a lot of time on. Um, and what we're trying to find out there is whether certain human characteristics are uh, more closely related to our genetic qualities and are more biologically driven, and whether other characteristics are more environmental, that uh, people act certain ways because of the individuals they're around. Now, it's very rare that something is entirely genetic or entirely environmental. What we find as we conduct research is that it usually falls somewhere in between, where there is a genetic influence, but there's also a social or cultural influence as well. What we're looking at today, then, would be a criminal minds. Is there something innate about the mind that makes one more likely to be a criminal and another less likely to be a criminal? So I'm going to uh, look at a couple of historical perspectives to give you guys a little background. Then we'll look at the human brain, and we'll specifically look at four parts where we do find significant differences between criminal minds compared to non-criminal minds. We'll briefly touch on what can be done about it, and then we'll have some fun thinking about some ethical quandaries that grow out of that. Uh, if you do have questions, don't be shy. Raise a hand. I'll be happy to answer as we go. If anybody's curious, I brought a sheep brain down. Feel free to pass it around, poke at it. If you don't like it, just let it go past. One of the reasons we use sheep brains is that anatomically they're extremely similar to the human brain, and then they're much cheaper. We get those for about 11 bucks a piece, and human brains cost closer to 600. So we can play and poke with those all we want. <laughs> yeah. I have a whole bucket of them in the lab. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I think most of the formaldehyde smell is gone. I dropped it off for Eric earlier. Uh, so, uh, taking a scientific approach to criminal science um, is fairly recent. In fact, we can kind of narrow down the date. November of 1871, when we saw a shift in the way um, criminology was approached. And a lot of it was due to this guy, Lombroso. Now, Lombroso, he was a, um, well, he was a prison doctor, and he was also a psychiatrist, meaning he had a medical background. Uh, in that November of 1871, he was doing an autopsy on a convicted killer, and he noticed that the guy had some depressions in his brain, indentations, if you will. Well, that led Lombroso to reject the popular idea at the time. At the time, it was thought that Crime was just kind of a human universal, that humans are by nature criminal, and we need a strong law and a strong society to keep that under control. Lambroso thought, no, there's probably something biological. There's probably something we can use to identify humans and tell if they're likely to become criminals or not. So Lambroso, he was definitely onto something here. He thought that crime originated from some deformities in the brain, and there's some truth to that. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, one reason you don't hear so much about Lambroso is he was also a very openly racist individual. Uh, specifically, um, as is typical of racist individuals, they always tend to feel that their group is the superior one. Lambroso speculated as an Italian Jewish individual that Italian Jewish individuals were more highly evolved and much less likely to commit crime. Um, and then he degenerated a lot of other groups. So that's one of the reasons his name's not so big today. He integrated his theory with phrenology, which was a popular pseudoscience at the time. It actually made its way back? It made its way back. OK, I thought somebody might be hungry. Um, I don't judge. So <laughs> phrenology was a very popular pseudoscience in the 1800s. It was believed at the time that we could tell a lot about people by the shape of their heads. And so uh, there were some people who still ridiculed it during that time period. Think of it uh, much like essential oils today, where you have some proponents and some that reject it. Our friend Lombroso here, he thought that we could look at bumps on the skull and we could tell whether you're going to be a criminal or whether you're going to be a, a peaceful individual. I know that sounds a little wacky and, yeah, it's completely discredited today, but the underlying assumption was that they knew during that time period different regions of the brain had different functions. 
So from that, they speculated that if you have a very large area here, that would cause your skull to be larger. Um, it was thought for a time period there that the size of one's skull was indicative of their intelligence. So they would go around pe measuring people's heads, and that was supposed to be a sign of how smart you were. That's discredited as well. Not true. But Lambroso kind of mixed these two together. Uh, and even though I'm kind of dismissive of him, it set off this scientific study of crime that we'll talk about today. Another doctor that you've probably all heard of, Sigmund Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud was an Austrian physician. He was never actually a psychologist. He treated a lot of wealthy individuals, and he noticed a lot of them seemed to have some personality problems. So he developed his talking theory from working with these wealthier patients. Now, Freud thought that there was something innate in humans that just made us violent people. In fact, he felt that we had these two competing instincts or drives within us. One he felt was this love-giving instinct. He called that eros and suggested that, uh, well, Freud was very sexually charged, really, and so he suggested that we had this love-giving instinct, and as we wandered the halls around campus, that we would have this urge to have sex with people we saw. But uh, he also thought that we had this destructive instinct, and he called that thanatos. He suggested as we wandered the halls, we also wanted to smack people down. So it's, it's not an understatement to say that, according to Freud, we went through life just either wanting to hit or hump everybody we met. Now, are we allowed to do that? As we wander the halls? I, I was just waiting to see who said yes. I was going to follow you around today. But no. <laughs> They're not going to let us do that as we wander the halls. And so Freud suggested that one of the reasons humanity was so um, repressed and angry was because we had these urges that we couldn't fulfill. Not to go too far into Freudian theory, he thought that was one of the reasons we often had violent or sexually charged dreams. It allowed us to do the things that would probably get us kicked out of campus. Um, but related to this then, Freud felt that we were innately violent people. We were innately criminal people. And there's a lot of ramifications for that. Um, when we think of that nature versus nurture question, it would affect how we create societies. So we make a lot of laws, we hire police, we make a lot of rules. If we can change people from being criminals or not, all of those things are useful. If it's something that can't be changed, then really we're just kind of like rabid dogs and uh, you know, the horrible ones need to be collected. So criminal justice would be very different under that system. We do know now that there is a genetic influence in our criminal behavior. That's not to say if you have um, a lot of violent relatives that you're just doomed to be violent. Uh, models today suggest it's a lot like alcoholism where one might have a predisposition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the way the script's gonna unfold. So how do we just study genetics? Uh, this data is on schizophrenia, but the idea is exactly the same. If we're trying to determine whether something is genetic or not, we look at genetic relatedness and concordance rates. So if you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, you're almost about 50% likely to have schizophrenia yourself. And remember, identical twins have 100% genetic overlap. Their DNA is the same. They occur when one egg is fertilized and splits in half, creating two genetically identical humans. Now, if we move down to a fraternal twin, which is a result of two eggs being fertilized by two sperm, there's only 50% genetic overlap and only about an 18% chance that you'll have schizophrenia if your fraternal twin does. I'm moving down to your nephew and niece. There's only 25% genetic overlap, only about a 5% you'll be schizophrenic if your nephew or niece is. And of course, an unrelated person, you don't have any genetic overlap with them. And the rates among the general population are about 2% for schizophrenia. So this is how we can explore things when we haven't identified a single gene. Uh, a lot of times people ask when we discuss genetics, well, you know, what's the gene for that? And we see that many human behaviors are caused by many genes. They're called polygenetics, so multiple genes influence something. Uh, an analogy there, if we look at a sexual orientation in humans, that has a biological component, but there hasn't been a single gene that's identified as this is the gay or straight gene. Now you can compare that to fruit flies, in fruit flies, a single gene has been identified, and scientists can essentially flip that switch either way they want, creating either heterosexual or homosexual fruit flies. So uh, genetics are coming a long way. In humans, it's not in the same place it is with fruit flies. 
When we look at genetics, we know that certain creatures can be specifically, specifically bred. I can't speak today, it's Monday. We can breed some animals and make them either more or less aggressive. And so if you're trying to create roosters for fighting, they can be bred that, in that fashion. Uh, certain dog species can be bred to make them more aggressive or less aggressive. One study looking at humans found that if you have a sibling convicted of a violent crime, you are four times as likely to commit one as well. So again, we don't have a single gene identified, but we do see that this is carried through genes. What about brains? That's what we wanted to talk about today, right? The criminal mind. Well, there are four areas of the human brain that are significantly different in violent criminals compared to people who are not. And again, if um, you happen to have a brain anomaly like this, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become a criminal. It just increases the likelihood. The amygdala is a part of the brain that's been implicated in a lot of the crime research. Uh, the amygdala, it's involved in memory, but it's also involved in fear, aggression, and social interactions. What's consistently being found is that individuals who commit violent crime tend to have a much smaller amygdala. So uh, theoretically then, we could do a brain scan, look at the amygdala size, and make a prediction about whether or not an individual is gonna be a criminal. Not only the size, there's an outer layer of the amygdala. And that outer layer is much thinner and less efficient for violent criminals compared to people who aren't uh, committing violent crime. Uh, what's either interesting or scary, and we'll kind of return to that theme in a little bit, is that changes in the amygdala have been noted in three-year-olds who were then followed over a 20-year period. And indeed, the ones who had smaller amygdalas as a child indeed committed more crime when they became an adult. So again, uh, it's indicating that predictions can be made based on changes in the brain. The anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, hopefully we all know the brain has two hemispheres, a right and a left hemisphere. And the way it communicates between the two sides, there are these thick fibrous strands called corpus callosum. Well, surrounding those threads is the anterior cortex. And again, we find some significant differences there. Now, that portion of the brain is involved in some higher level functions, things like attention allocation. Uh, it's involved in your reward circuits. Uh, it's also involved in decision making and morality. And we're seeing less activity in this region of the brain compared to non-criminal populations. Uh, one study used an fMRI to look at the brains of 100 male inmates while they were in prison. They completed a task. Uh, he found that those with lower activation in this area were much more likely to reoffend uh, and had higher reincarceration rates four years later. So again, this is another region of the brain that's uh, strongly implicated in criminal activity. Um, if anybody's curious, the way they track that's with an fMRI. Uh, what the fMRI does is it tracks oxygenated blood while it moves through uh, the body, but certainly within the brain. And kind of the underlying assumption is that the more of that oxygenated blood going to an area, the more of that part of the brain or part of the body is being used. So uh, that way we can we'll gain information without having to crack some skulls open. The last two areas I was gonna talk about today, the frontal gyrus and the prefrontal cortex. I'm really gonna kind of put those two together. The frontal gyrus is a portion of the prefrontal cortex. That's the very front portion of the brain, and we often think of it as the executive decision-making part of the brain. Uh, what's interesting and relevant for some people in this room, that prefrontal cortex doesn't finish developing until around the age of 25. A little bit earlier for females, a little bit later for males. And so that partially explains some of the risky decision-making that we see people in their late teens and early 20s doing. That's also relevant for our discussion here. When we compare the prefrontal cortex of people who commit violent crime, we see that there's less activation, there's less activity there. They're essentially remaining much like a teenager for the rest of their lives. They're uh, gonna be more likely to engage in uh, risky decisions that you know, may or may not land them in prison. So think of this as um, not necessarily causing crime, but it does allow for poor decision making in conjunction with these other aspects of the brain.
one thing to keep in mind with the brain is that it's always developing and changing. We often think of like a leg bone. And the leg bone, once it's developed, stays about the same unless you shatter it. The brain, that's not the truth. Uh, the brain will continue to shift. Um, it had been thought in the past that new neurons couldn't be developed. Now we're finding out, even in adulthood, that the brain is capable of neurogenesis. The brain is capable of creating new neural pathways. And so uh, there have been some studies looking at ways then to change the brain and change behavior without actually having to you know, crack any heads open. One thing that's been successfully used in several studies are nutritional enrichment, uh, particularly when we're looking at smaller age children. Uh, one of the reasons that it's typical for individuals from lower income households to commit more crime and engage in poorer activities at school is because of those nutritional <laughs> deficiencies. So individuals who don't have enough iron, for example, often uh, act up at school and tend to have more problems. So one intervention, for example, focused on three-year-olds who were provided better nutrition as well as exercise. They were tracked for a 23-year period. And after that 23-year period, the kids who did not receive that, the group that they were comparing them with, were four times as likely to commit crimes as the children who had been through this enrichment program. So it seems to suggest to us that, yeah, proper nutrition is pretty important. Uh, another study in Colorado found that pregnant low-income mothers who were visited regularly by nurses who talked to them about health and education were much less likely to have children arrested in their teenage years. We're seeing some results then of these enrichment programs. An even simpler intervention might make a difference. Uh, one study looked at prisoners who had committed violent crimes. Uh, they were British. I'm not sure if that makes any difference. But they signed them up for a 10-year, they're mostly like us, right? Uh, they signed them up for a 10-week yoga class. And at the end of that yoga class, the prisoners who had gone through the program were less likely to be arrested later. So uh, exercise, diet, that helps the brain. It's good for us. Keeps you out of jail. Uh, thoughts on that? I mean, I haven't gone to jail. See, there you go. There you go. It's always awkward when I see students in the Sweetwater now in the morning. I'm like, how was your weekend? Uh, it consistently happens. And so, really the last thing I want to talk about today then are some of the ethical quandaries associated with this. Uh, we've determined pretty conclusively that we can look at brains and make predictions about who's more likely to commit crime. So then, would we be comfortable with surgery on small children? to uh, make them less likely to commit crime? No. no, okay, good, somebody has an opinion. Everybody's just looking at me. No, you don't like that idea, right? Because they haven't committed any crimes yet. Uh, does anybody argue the other? I'm just like, no. <laughs> 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 hey, I just played devil's advocate, so. <laughs> so should I say, yes, let's do it. Uh, either way, yeah, I'll probably. How you process things Yes, it was. Yeah. But that also has huge impacts on people. You're less empathetic and you tend to feel less. Yes, that's absolutely correct as well. So I'm with you, so it's okay. But I'll argue with pretty much anybody if they want to. Uh, Jane, can ask you my mother. Her statement so we can get that recorded. Ah, uh, yes. She was mentioning that in the past, lobotomies were pushed as a way to uh, reduce crime, reduce. Uh, not necessarily crime, but bad behavior. It was. They did. Uh, if you were homosexual, uh huh. Had ADHD. Uh huh. Sorts of different things that that's not the way to deal with it. No, no, I'm on your side. That was most of your statement, right? Yeah. Okay, I think I repeated that loud enough. So yeah, the comparison can be made to lobotomies or or a lot of procedures we've used in the past. Uh, that being said, there are certain individuals who do push that notion that, you know, we should do preventative surgery on others. Uh, fortunately, there are other methods that work. Uh, a lot of therapeutic techniques have shown some use. In fact, one study started providing, one study, the researchers, the study didn't do anything, the researchers on the study started providing therapy for children that were identified as high risk for crime. And uh, we've seen that to be fairly effective. It seems to be working really well. On the last slide, I mentioned the importance of nutrition. Of course, uh, there are some supplements that are seem, seem to be effective. 
One researcher has been working with small children and found that omega-3, uh, fish oil, actually decreases crime. It helps cellular growth in the brain. Uh, so if we're getting those amygdalas to grow similar to a typical person, uh, it seems to crack down on crime. What I think you guys were suggesting, though, is that uh, even though neurocriminology can provide us with a lot of information, it can also lead to this slippery slope to a, an Armageddon or um, you know, cleaning out certain uh, se yeah, segments of the population that may be seen as undesirable. So what's that? Yeah. Yes, eugenics. That's a great example. Um, you know, I mentioned a moment ago about the fruit flies and how we can, I don't do it, but how researchers can alter the sexual orientation of a fruit fly just at whim. If that capacity existed for humans, then... I don't make moral decisions. That's for everybody else to make. <laughs> no, that's a fun question, but I, I do my best in the classroom never to delve into my personal beliefs and values, and that way everybody can work on their own, and that way uh, there's less conflict. So, uh, But I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, other thoughts? No. I promised this was 15 minutes longer when I did it at my house yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, that's really all I've got for you today. You guys need that Q code. <laughs> and if you do have any questions and you just weren't comfortable asking them in here, yes? Uh, my question with uh, regards to uh, brain development. Uh huh. If, you know, like m muscles can, can be built through various exercise, if, if the doing of certain activities, let's say uh, more morally ethnic activities, will that increase the growth of those parts of? I think I understand your question. So if we um, use portions of the brain, will that increase their cognitive power? Yes. Uh, the only exception to the no I'm about to say is in older age. Um, keeping the mind active can slow down some of the decline. But to answer your question directly, directly, like the amygdala that's evolved in emotion processing, uh, just exposing you to a lot of emotion is not going to make that portion of the brain get bigger. So I'm inclined to say no on that. No, that's a fun question, though. I like that one. Yeah. So <clears throat> is there evidence that supports a person who commits a violent crime um, that doesn't identify any of the scientific reasons back about behind the reason why? Sure, sure. Um, think again of that nature versus nurture. We see that there are some biological markers that one is likely to engage in violent crime, but there are still social factors. So if you had a, say, average developed brain, you didn't have any of these symptoms up here, but you, I don't know, hung out with a bunch of, I don't know, thieves, then uh, to fit in with that culture, you're more likely to engage in that activity. So uh, this is predictive, but it doesn't tell the whole picture. Okay. No, that's a fun question. For more questions, or you guys got a few more questions? I know you all have one o'clock class, but we have plenty of time. Any other questions come to mind? Do you have any research about um, kids that come from like broken homes? Because I know that for a while, when my parents got divorced, they were like, Your kids were more, well, the son was more likely, or this was outside pity, it's not like professional, but there were people saying your son's more likely to have. Yes, there's some truth to that, although uh, I think the media kind of presents that falsely a lot of times, that false narrative that, you know, if you come from a broken home, that leads to behavioral problems. Uh, if it's a, a divorce where both parents are adapting to it well, they're taking care of the child, blah, 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 doing the things they're supposed to do, those kids come out as air quote normal as any other children. But uh, we see uh, a lot of people have less money after a divorce than they did before. So uh, that can affect nutrition and other things. Uh, uh, if there's like an endless string of new girlfriends and boyfriends, that can cause behavioral problems. So it's not really the divorce itself that leads to uh, adolescent trouble. It's a lot of the factors associated with that. Does that help? Yeah. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Um, so um, let me use myself as an example. Sure. If I am very quick tempered. My husband is quick tempered. The generic thing that you're talking about, does it affect my kids also? Uh, 
Yes, the link isn't quite as close there, but a lot of our personality traits do run in families. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you and your husband are both very quick tempered, mm -hmm. uh, well, you've got a couple things going on there. One, there are some genetic factors, so that makes your children more likely to be quick tempered. And then secondly, the social factors. If the child growing up sees that that's how you respond to situations is by being quick tempered, they're gonna learn that behavior as well. So kind of that combination of nature and nurture there. And then if you are in a household where like everything is given unto you, but you grow up to be a brat, like does it, why did they learn those things? I don't get it. Well, um, if it's generic. Yeah, if somebody uh, grows up, if understood right, and has things pretty much given to them, why do they grow up to be a brat? Uh, there are some studies finding that if children don't have to go through some adversity, they never learn how to. So if a child, uh, kind of continue with that example, just has everything given to them, and then they go out in the workplace as an adult, everybody's not just going to give you everything you want at work. So they're going to have some behavioral problems there, at least the tendency to. No, those were good questions. Since we have a little time, do you sure. want to talk about some of the classes that you offer or some research that you're currently working on? Sure. Um, let's see. I do most of my research in two areas. One area I research uh, primarily is the area of physical attractiveness stereotypes. Uh, we find that in society, more attractive people tend to receive beneficial treatment from others. Conversely, life's not a Disney film, so our friend Quasimodo usually doesn't end up with the princess in the end. Uh, and so uh, I guess um, the one paper that was kind of notorious about five years ago now, I uh, did a study where I found that if everything else is equal, students actually learn more from more attractive teachers than from less attractive ones. So yeah, you guys are in trouble. Uh, I should be warned. Uh, but, but yeah, for that study, I uh, told participants that I was conducting a study on whether or not students could learn as well online as in person. I had them uh, listen to an introductory physics course and I manipulated the picture on screen they believed was their teacher. Uh, when they had the attractive teacher, whether they were male or female, uh, either the participant or the teacher, they actually did better on the multiple choice quiz uh, when they had the person they thought was more attractive. So um, I've been doing some research in that area. Uh, let's see, the most recent paper I had come out, there were five of us working on it. I was third author, but it was on a NASA funded grant where we were trying to develop a scale that measures the perceived social intelligence of robots. Obviously, uh, robots don't have social skills, but they often act like it. And so we were trying to come up with a measure that would gauge how you thought that robot interacted with others. Uh, that one was recently published. Um, it was about two years ago I published one paper, again, looking at attractiveness and the notion of a just world. Uh, we find that humans vary a lot in how just and fair they believe the world is. And we know that in the United States, uh, white males tend to believe the world is more fair and just, whereas more stigmatized populations, such as people of color and women, tend to think that the world is not as fair of a place. And so I conducted two studies, one where people rated their own attractiveness, and then a second one where uh, other people rated how hot or not they were. Then all of those participants filled out a survey that assesses their you know, feeling of how fair and just the world is. And we found exactly what we predicted, that the more attractive people thought the world was a much more fair and a better place than the people who weren't. Um, kind of the rationale there, again, is that uh, more stigmatized people, including like really unattractive people, have to work a lot harder to achieve things than people who have a lot of benefits. So um, that's some of the work I've been working on, uh, kind of continuing along those lines. Uh, questions about that stuff? No? Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, that's primarily what I do. Um, but I thought I'd take a stab at this one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then I also publish uh, some articles um, uh, examining the evolutionary factors that influence human mating. If you're interested in it, I teach the only course on evolutionary psych in the state of Wyoming. I do that once a spring, so uh, otherwise you'd have to go out of the state to do that. But we look at some of the differences you see in long-term mating strategies for both men and women. Um, Kind of the underlying philosophy there is something known as parental investment theory. It was developed by a researcher who's still alive named Robert Trivers. Uh, he's actually emailed me twice in my life and I squealed like a little fanboy both times. I was like, he knows I'm alive. But um, uh, what Trivers did is he looked at a variety of species and what he found was that in any species you look at, the sex that has to take care of the offspring is pickier about who they mate with. 
So with humans, it's typically the female who's pickier about who they mate with. Uh, some other species, such as birds, uh, where the males take care of the offspring, the male are, males are real picky who they mate with because who wants to get stuck taking care of baby birds, right? And so, um, so then he kind of applied that to some other different species. Uh, and the idea that whichever sex is going to be most inconvenienced by creating offspring is going to be the sex that's pickier. You know, for human females, it's at least nine months of inconvenience, even if you give them away right away. Uh, nowadays, they're going to live in your basement till you're 30. So, you know, there's a big inconvenience there. Whereas guys, you know, there's about five or 10 minutes of fun, and that's all the required commitment is. So that's why males tend to be pickier. Um, little uh, bit of trivia. That one just kind of took a moment. Sleeper effect. Uh, I don't think you laugh at anything. <laughs> um, a little bit of trivia that Trivers uh, was one of the people who have discovered this. This would be like the one thing you guys remember today. Penguins are one of the only other species that we've observed prostitution with. And I know you're wondering how they get paid. It's the pebbles. What? Yes, pebbles, rocks. Absolutely it, yes. So yeah, if you're ever at the zoo or somewhere out in the wilderness and you see a penguin with a big nest, you know that's the really active ones. Uh, <laughs> I phrased that politely, didn't I, Stacy? <laughs> now did I see why I said the best for last? <laughs> I'll pad this more for Wednesday. Um, oh, so come back Wednesday. He's got more to add. <laughs> yeah, probably more bad jokes, but that's what I do. Um, good. Good, good. Well, you know, uh, something I was lecturing about the other day, we find that uh, in human females, there's a strong tendency to like guys who are funny, but we don't see where males have that tendency. Males typically really don't care whether their girlfriends or wives are funny. Uh, it's more of a one-sided thing there. In fact, what men seem to care about is they like women who seem to appreciate their sense of humor. Uh, yeah? Okay. So, yeah, you guys think I'm funny? I love you all right now. <laughs> Great group of people. Uh, what else? Any questions about anything? One more. Sure. How can I help? It's kind of a, a general question, so it's okay if the answer is just general. It's broad. How, how do, uh, generally speaking, religious beliefs factor into human psychology? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, that's fun. Um, uh, there are a lot of impacts. In fact, uh, uh, I used to go to school at Texas Tech University. Red Raiders. Uh, Nobody knows what I'm doing except for me. <sighs> I'll circle to that. But to answer, yeah, at Texas Tech, we're the Red Raiders. So, uh, you know, our slogan, we put our guns up like this. And if you see somebody else with a Texas Tech shirt on, you both have to put your guns up. And then you go give each other this big, sweaty bro hug. Yes, I do. <sighs> Once you're indoctrinated, you know, what can you do? But, yeah, at Texas Tech, we had a course on religion and psychology. A few other schools do as well. I took it. It was a very interesting one. Uh, I guess the broad way to answer that question is religion is a part of a person's culture. So when we think of culture, that involves politics, that involves music, that involves a lot of different things, and religiosity is a part of that. So you do uh, see some you know, interesting effects with religiosity. Um, was that? I mean, it's a big question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I wasn't uh, sure exactly where. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think I of mean, some. You, you took an entire course on it. Yes. But I don't expect to, you know, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see it uh, has both positive and negative effects. Uh, for some people, it works very well as a functional way to reduce or eliminate guilt, um, which is kind of a traditional uh, use of psychology. So, uh, yes, as far as like reduction of guilt. However, in other contexts, religiosity is a driving force for guilt. We were just talking about human sexuality, and we find that uh, that affects people's mating habits. So. Um, so yeah, religion plays a huge role in psychology, uh, and it was kind of swept under the rug for a lot of years. About 50 years ago, the American Psychological Association created a new branch just to study religion and psychology. Uh, I guess my answer there is it's becoming a bigger part of it instead of... Was that initial kind of like keeping under the rug out of, you know, like a, a separation and, of thinking of religion and, and science? Yes, yes. And that... You know, what's interesting, uh, psychology itself is a pretty new discipline, um, and it was formed by merging physiology, I think biology, things we've been talking about today, and philosophy together. So those two are really intertwined. Now, uh, there was a movement by a guy named John B. Watson, who was a behaviorist, 
And he suggested, after about 80 years of psychology, he suggested that, you know, we need to do things differently. We're trying to study consciousness. And I have no clue what any of you are actually thinking right now. You might could tell me, but we know humans lie a lot. And so Watson then pushed for this shift to studying things that we could only observe, observable behavior. Uh, that's when we saw the increase in rat studies, for example. If we're studying consciousness, a rat's not very useful for me. But if we're studying behavior, I can see whether a rat pushes a button or not. And it was during that time period that there was this shift to kind of a hyper-scientific approach to psychology that uh, religion and some of the more philosophical elements were kind of pushed to the side. Uh, and then in the 1960s, we had a time period called the Cognitive Revolution. What people did, they really just rebranded consciousness. At the time, if you said you wanted to study consciousness, you'd be ridiculed. So a group of researchers said, well, we'll study cognition. That's the thought processes of memory and blah, blah, blah. And everybody thought, hey, OK, we're on board with that. So uh, there's been kind of a shift back then to studying those mental processes. So do you think, um, like religion and that, is it, do they manipulate people just to make them do whatever the religious thing wants them to do? Or it, it, it depends a lot on the religion and faith. Um, to kind of uh, extend on that, uh, there's this notion of cognitive dissonance theory. The idea that if you hold two competing ideas, or if your ideas compete with your behavior, it's going to cause you distress. Uh, and so what's suggested then is you have to eliminate one of those thoughts or behaviors. The way that research came about, a researcher was originally interested in studying doomsday cults. Uh, you know, specifically what happens to these group members in a doomsday cult when the end doesn't happen. So imagine like this afternoon if my talk was so awesome that you all went and sold your belongings and gave me all your money and joined the cult of shame. All right? Stranger things have happened. Uh, so, <laughs> so imagine you had joined this cult and as a part of that cult I had convinced you that the world was going to end on February 28th. Well, it's March 1st. How do you think you would feel now? Feel lost? Lied to? Somebody's going to be angry with me, right? Yeah. OK, you didn't want to say that. Well, <laughs> um, what he found was really interesting in that when uh, members are in a doomsday cult and the end doesn't happen, many of them become more committed to the cult than they were before. Because you really have two ideas, two choices. You can either say, OK, Shane just got the date wrong. This cult of Shane thing's really awesome. Or you have to realize that you just kind of wasted your life. Uh, which one's easier to do? It's easier to believe that, hey, yeah, change the due date. And that's exactly what happens. Um, most of you are pretty young, but there was a cult, the Branch Davidians, outside of Waco, Texas. They had a big yeah. compound. I grew up near Waco. Okay, awesome. Is that the one with the aliens and the. No, it's the one the FBI kind of just the whole Yeah, yeah. As far as what actually happened, it depends on who you ask. But the, the uh, FBI went to arrest the leader. And instead of just like grabbing him out by the mailbox, they decided to encircle the compound. Well, then the people in the compound started shooting back at the FBI, and they had this like two-month standoff. Eventually, who knows what really happened, uh, but the FBI threw in these tear gas canisters, their compound caught on fire, and like, what was it, like 80 or 90 people died, and yeah. including a bunch of kids. Yes, yeah, it was big in the news. And the reason I mention that now, they don't have a nice compound anymore, but if you go outside that area, they have this big sign uh, dedicated to the martyrs of the cult who died, and they have some trailers where they've started a new little compound. So, yeah, yeah I'm serious. Yeah. And it was, uh, the leader was also pretty decent friends with the uh, Oklahoma bomber. See, I didn't know that. That's yeah, interesting. They, they had letters back and forth together. Okay, okay. Yeah, the one you ask about the aliens, uh, interesting bit of trivia there. That guy was originally, uh, called himself Doe. His original name was Marshall Applewhite. Yeah, they changed all their, yeah. Yeah. Their names and sell all their belongings. And, yeah. yeah, and then before the end time came, they thought they were going to catch a ride on a comet that was coming nearby. And so uh, to catch a ride on the comet, I don't know what's required. They poison and put a bag over their heads and put like seven cents in their shoe or something. Yeah. And they were all holding their passports and all the guys had to get snipped before this. I don't know why. That, that's where I draw the line. I'm like, no, I'll go join another church. Uh, but Marshall Applewhite was uh, born in the same little town that my family's from, Spur, Texas. In fact, my uncle went to high school with him. And our former uh, president, Dr. Leach, was from Spur as well. So uh, a lot of connections there. Uh, don't join any doomsday cults today. <laughs> At least give it a second thought. Uh, <laughs> go for it. Yeah.
to land eventually. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry. I don't make value decisions for people. So if you want to be culty, be culty. And if you don't, don't. It's a personal choice. Uh, other thoughts? Club active semester? <sighs> yes and no. Uh, we have a psychology club. It was uh, building up really well. We were getting quite a few members. Um, a couple years ago, I took a couple to a conference in Denver. We were looking at doing that again. And then COVID hit, and that really sidelined everything. Last semester, we couldn't have in purpose in meetings. So uh, at the moment, it's a bit more informal, where I'm just kind of meeting with some students that are active in research or trying to get into graduate programs. I'm hoping that this COVID thing will kind of die down by the fall and we can go uh, back at it pretty strong. But if you do have any interest in the psychology club, just shoot me an email or say hi to me or something. and uh, I'll make sure you get included on those group emails. Okay, okay. Um, let me give you a card and it has my email. And somebody else's card. <laughs> there we go. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you, Shane. Oh, of course. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.